Between uh, 2013 and 2018, Chip and Joanna Gaines uh, recorded 179 episodes of Fixer Upper where they took one of the worst houses they could find in one of the best neighborhoods and turned it into somebody's dream house. If you've ever watched the show, the high point is at the end when the family getting the new house, they've bought it, and they're not allowed to go out and look during the renovation project, so when they see their new house, you ready to see it? They're always like, oh my goodness, how did you, do? you've changed the house. It's beautiful. So I got to thinking, we like stories of a changed house. How about a changed life? How about we do a fixer-upper on our life? Everybody wants to be happy. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, parent or a teenager, married or single, you want to be happy. But most people aren't happy. So how can we do a fixer-upper on our minds and become happy? A study with 275,000 participants found happiness leads to success in nearly every domain of our lives, including marriage, health, friendship, community involvement, creativity, jobs, careers, and businesses. Now here's the really interesting part. It intuitively makes sense that happy people do better. It's because of the success that they're happy, right? Wrong. Study after study shows that happiness precedes important outcomes. People aren't happy because they're successful. They're successful because they're happy. So back to my question. How do we do a fixer-upper on our attitudes and become happy? Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. As Jesus approached death on the cross, he said, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you. Christ came for us to experience joy. He wants us to experience true happiness. He created this world for us to enjoy. Nothing makes him have more glory than when we're enjoying what he's given us. And we're deliriously happy. Yet few, few people experience this happiness Christ came to give. I dare say the majority of Christians <coughs> do not experience this happiness. So I want to ask two questions today. <coughs> what ways of thinking steal our happiness? And what ways of thinking uh, bring us happiness? All right, so one of the best places to look for true happiness is the Apostle Paul's book to the people at Philippi. If you want to turn, it's on, on our Bibles. It's page 1,178. <coughs> Philippi was located in northern Greece in the Roman province of Macedonia. Uh, in this letter, which is really a thank you for their generous support for him and the Christians in Jerusalem, provide, Paul provides some of the best advice we'll ever hear on how to experience joy. Paul uses the word joy 19 times in this book. What's the secret of his joy? The secret is found in another word. If you're looking for the the theme of a book, you look for key words that are repeated over and over again. The other word is mind. He uses it 16 times. The secret of Christian joy is in the way we think. Paul begins his letter by praying that the Philippians will think more clearly. He prays that their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Paul says, to be happy, you have to know something. You have to know how to think. There are no benefits to being ignorant. Show me the benefit of not knowing CPR. You say, well, the benefit is if somebody gets in an accident or there's a drowning, I don't have to do anything. 
I, I say, you know, I don't know anything about CPR, so I can't help. I don't do mouth to mouth. Well, that may be a benefit, unless it's your child, unless it's your husband or your wife, unless it's your friend. Tell me a benefit. Tell me one benefit of not knowing the Heimlich method for expelling an object out of someone's throat. There are no benefits. <coughs> he also prays that they might have a depth of insight so they may be able to discern what is best. He uses the Greek word diaphero, <coughs> which means to have common sense. Common sense is knowing how to pray before a meal. The children are restless. Uh, the teenagers are ready to eat, and you've been given the opportunity to pray. Common sense is knowing how long. The kids are, are waiting. Mashed potatoes get cold quickly. To be happy, Paul says you have to have knowledge and common sense. If you want to have, be happy, you have to think right. In this letter, Paul gives us five wrong ways of thinking that steal our happiness and five right ways of thinking that bring us happiness. Today we're going to do a flyover. We're going to look at the whole book, 105 verses. This is kind of like a summary report. And in the 13 weeks ahead, we're going to drill down into the principles we see today. So, the first wrong way of thinking that will steal your happiness is to think circumstances determine our happiness. You say, that's right. I've just been disturbed <clears throat> divorce papers. I just buried a loved one. I just lost my job. I've just been diagnosed with a terminal illness. I have every right to be unhappy. No, you don't. Circumstances don't determine our happiness. There are lots of people in this world that are very privileged, but they're unhappy. And there are many people in this world that have practically nothing, but they're very happy. Apostle Paul wrote this book from prison. He was chained to a Roman guard. He was facing martyrdom. He had health problems. He had many critics, yet he overflows with joy. <clears throat> Circumstances do not determine our happiness. If we depend, uh, if our happiness depends on ideal circumstances, we'll never be happy because life is filled with sinkholes and troubles. The second wrong way to think is to think people cause our problems. You think, I would be happy if only I didn't have such a terrible husband. If only I didn't have a nagging wife. If only I didn't have to work for such a horrible boss. If only I didn't have such a terrible teacher. If only I didn't have such a past for a brother or sister. If only my kids wouldn't do such stupid things. If only my parents weren't so strict, then I'd be happy. When you let other people determine whether or not you're happy, you're giving them way too much control over your life. Why would you want to give them that kind of power over you? I can't blame someone else for my unhappiness. I'm responsible for my happiness. <coughs> If, I, if our happiness depends on people, we won't be happy because people let us down. Third wrong way to think is to think negatively. The Apostle Paul does not think negatively even though he's in prison. Thinking negatively when circumstances happen that are not good is a certain way to sap our joy. Fourth wrong way to think is to worry. Apostle Paul had plenty of reasons to worry in prison, but he chose joy instead. 
Nothing steals joy like worry. It keeps us from enjoying the present because we're worried about something that might happen in the future. The fifth wrong way to think is to think things will make us happy. The message of TV ads is that if you just have this car, get this smartphone, buy these clothes, this fragrance, you'll be happy. So if we have enough money so we can have whatever we want, then we'll be happy. Of course, this is the wrong way to think. Because things don't make us happy. Studies show a very weak correlation between wealth and contentment. And the more prosperous a nation grows, the more common is depression. If we stand back to see what we've learned about happiness over the centuries, it's striking to see our lack of progress. Think of how we have surpassed our ancestors in our ability to travel and communicate, in our accomplishments in medicine and science. Think how much less brutal and unjust to minorities many societies around the world are than even 100 years ago. I mean, our lives have been transformed. But even though we are unimaginably wealthier and more comfortable, no one's arguing that we are significantly happier than people who lived before us, especially if we use the rise of depression and suicide as an indicator. Let's test the assumption that things make us happy. Are you happier since you got your last raise? Probably not. Are you happier since you went on your last shopping trip? Oh, <laughs> Jamie says yes. <laughs> All right. Shouldn't have asked that one. Shouldn't have looked your way. Are you happier since you got that toy you've been wanting? So Paul identifies five ways of thinking, or wrong ways of thinking about happiness. Thinking circumstances determine our happiness. Thinking people cause our problems. Thinking negatively, worrying, and thinking things will make us happy. These are the wrong ways to think. If you want to be happy, you have to think right. So what are the right ways to think? <clears throat> Paul identifies five. We're going to look at them briefly today, then we're going to look at them more, de more deeply in the weeks ahead. The first and most important way to think that will bring you happiness is to think in a God-centered way. So if you have to pick one of these five out of this book as being the most important, this is it. Get vitally connected to God. Turn your life over to Christ. Spend time daily with him in his word and in prayer. As Augustine famously says to God at the beginning of, of his book, The Confessions, you stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We were made for God. So nothing can bring us happiness without, I mean, true happiness without God. So here's the first key to happiness. If you love anything more than God, you will harm the object of your love and you'll harm yourself and you'll be dissatisfied and discontent. To the degree that you move toward loving God supremely, everything will begin to fall in place in your life. You begin to enjoy things for what they're meant to be enjoyed for. Uh, a job and money become what they're supposed to be. A job is a way for you to use your gifts to make a difference for other people in this world. Money is a means to support yourself and your family. But things are not the source of your contentment. God is. Paul prays for the Philippians, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. This is an important prayer. It's one thing to give your life to Christ at 
a Young Life camp or uh, an Easter service, but you're wondering, will this stay with me? Well, Paul gives you the answer. God will finish the work he began. So how do you find happiness? You become God-centered in your thinking. The reason that Paul maintained his happiness, even though he was in prison, was because he was God-centered in his thinking. He didn't lock in on how terrible it was that he was in prison. But he thought about what God was doing through his imprisonment. Paul talks about, you know, his rivals who hated him and he was about to be executed or maybe going to be executed. Then he says in first chapter eight, verse 18, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Notice his joy. These are two of the uses of his word, rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. For to me, this is one of the famous verses of this book, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's not afraid of death. If he dies, he gets to go be in heaven and be with Christ. But if he lives, he can continue to lead more people to Christ. It's a win-win. He maintains his true joy in the face of martyrdom by thinking about Christ. Uh, the reason we get upset by circumstances is because we lose our focus on Christ. If you can keep your focus on Christ, you can be happy no matter what your circumstance because you can serve Christ in any situation. Chapter 3, Paul says, But whatever were gains to me, I can now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Christ and his relationship with Christ is the top thing in his life. Then he adds, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. He wants to know the power of Christ's resurrection working within him. When we give our lives to Christ, God comes inside and we have the same power working within us that God used when he raised Christ from the dead. If you, like Paul, think about Christ and his power available to you, then circumstances don't need to steal your happiness. For you can serve Christ as well in sickness and in health in poverty or in wealth. So what circumstances do you face? What's your prison? Loss of a job? A sickness? Disability? An impossible situation at home? Trouble at school? Your prison may not change, but you can. You can experience a fixer-upper in the way you think. Think about God. Keep your focus on him. And you can experience joy in any circumstance. The second right way to think is to think of others as more important than yourself. Instead of allowing other people to steal your happiness, by them being cruel to you, Paul says, no, think this way. Chapter 2, why don't you read this with me? Therefore, if you have any encouragement for being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. There it is. Value others above yourselves. That doesn't mean they're above you. We were all created in God's image. We're infinitely valuable. But you treat them as if they were more important than yourself. If you make this your attitude toward all other people in this world, 
People no longer need to steal your happiness. Now, Paul cites Jesus as the ultimate example of treating others as more important than yourselves. Read this with me. This is also a very famous passage in this book. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, <clears throat> he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. So he gave up his glory in heaven as the son of God. He was still the son of God, but he gave it up, all the trappings, to become a baby born in a stable to serve us. He regarded our welfare as more important than his own. A third right way to think is to think to praise. This may be one of the most difficult. A study of allowing ourselves to think negatively when we face difficult circumstances, we praise. When something bad happens, instead of going all negative, turn your mind to praise God. Praise God that he's greater than your situation. This will put a smile on your face. Your smile will increase your face value. You look better when you smile. Everybody looks better when they smile. The Apostle Paul learned this secret. Luke tells us in Acts 16 how Paul's first visit to Philippi began. Paul cast a demon out of a girl who was making lots of money for her owners by telling people's fortunes. Well, Paul cast the demon out of her when the owners saw that they'd lost their means for making money. They hauled him before the authorities. The authorities had Paul and Silas flogged. When they were done, their backs were like ribbons. Then they threw them in prison. Well, what they did was illegal. It was illegal to flog a Roman citizen, but they never stopped to ask. So Paul could have said, hey, this, what you've done is not right. He could have, you know, filed a lawsuit with the ACLU and, and said, you know, we've got to fix this. Instead, we find them at midnight, Paul and Silas in the jail, praising God. Paul tells us, do everything without grumbling or arguing. God commands us not to think negatively. Complaining destroys joy. It's inappropriate for the child of God. Why? So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Anybody can complain and think negatively. Christians are to be different. Choosing to praise instead of being all negative makes us stand out like stars in a dark sky. Paul says, this is one of the most famous verses in this book. Read this with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Paul says, Look for what we can praise God for in all situations. When things uh, go your, don't go your way, do you think to praise? Or do you get all negative and start complaining and get cynical? The fourth right way to think is to pray. When things don't go well, our tendency is to worry. The vast majority of things we worry about never happen, so worry, for the most part, is a big waste of time. Paul suggests a better way. Another famous verse in this book. Read this with me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, be request to God. We're to refuse to worry. Instead, we're to tell God our needs in prayer. So 
something happens to you and you start to worry and say, okay, I'm not going to do that, God. You turn it into a prayer. God, would you help in this situation? I'm so worried about, would you? You show me a person who's a negative thinker, who's always thinking on the dark side of life, constantly worrying about things that might occur, and I'll show you a person who doesn't pray. You can't worry and pray at the same time. They just don't mix. If we pray and put our concerns in God's hand, he promises to give us peace. Read this with me. This is one of the um, indications of joy in your life. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The concern doesn't have to steal your joy. If you want to be happy, learn to pray instead of worry. Finally, the right way to think is to think contentment. It's one of my daughters. How about that? <clears throat> Paul, uh, Paul doesn't think about what he doesn't have. He talks about what he does have. Why don't you read this with me? I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul learned the secret of contentment. He was content with a lot or a little. Because he knew that in all situations, God would provide. All right, so let's review. Five right ways to think and five wrong ways to think. Right way to think, probably the most important on this list, to be God-centered. Instead of focusing on our circumstances, which is the wrong way to think. The right way to think is to think of others as more important than yourself. Wrong way to think is to think, people cause my problems. I'd be happy if I wasn't for people. The right way to think is to praise. Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. The wrong way to think is to think negatively. The right way to think is to pray. The wrong way to think is to worry. The right way to think is to be content with what you have. What your situation is, the wrong way to think, is to be discontent. If only I could have. So, to be happy, we have to discipline our minds. Young Jewish girls surrounded by the horrors of a Nazi concentration camp had the grace and composure to write this poem. From tomorrow on, I shall be sad. From tomorrow on, not today. Today, I will be glad in every day. No matter how bitter it may be, I shall say, from tomorrow on I shall be sad, not today. Americans have written a less grateful adaptation to this poem. From tomorrow on I shall be happy. From tomorrow on, not today. And every day, no matter how good things may be, I shall say, from tomorrow on I'll be happy, not today. When are you going to be happy? It's up to you, God, and your mind. If you want to be happy, you must think right. You need a fixer-upper on the way you think. Father, thank you for this book the Apostle Paul wrote, showing his joy in the midst of very difficult circumstances. What an inspiration it is to us. We want to be happy. Every one of us here, the things we try to do are, are all strategies to, to bring us happiness. 
but so many of us are not experiencing it. So today, we'd like to begin a journey to learn to think in the right way. All right, so let's start with, uh, I'd like you to bow your heads and pray to God. Let's start with confessing our unhappiness. I'm going to guess we're all unhappy about something, and some of us are basically unhappy. Start by confessing that. God already knows it. Say, so, okay, get that on the table with God. And then tell him, you know, God, I do want to be happy, and I want to go all on in, uh, all in on this series of learning how to think in a better way, think in a Christian way. So I want to try to be here and lock into this and learn to think in a better way. You tell God that or whatever you want to tell him right now. You pray. Father, thank you for creating this beautiful world, this huge universe, giving us life, sending your son to show us how to live and to die for our sins then giving us your Holy Spirit. All this, we bring you most glory when we enjoy it and experience true happiness. So we want to pursue that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.